We've been going through the book of Judges and literally every week we kind of have the same cycle. The Israelites fall away from God. They cry out to God at some point. The oppression, and here is my terrible map of, of uh, Canaan and really the region of Israel. The Israelites, broken up into 12 different tribes throughout the region of Israel, are being oppressed by their neighbors because they are not faithful to God and they are falling away from, from believing in God and teaching their children about God. And things will eventually get so bad that the people will cry out and say, God, please save us from our enemies. We repent. We admit we were wrong. You were right. Please save us. And God, because he is merciful, says, okay, I will save you. And he raises up judges. And judges is another Hebrew name for, for a leader. <clears throat> and typically the pattern goes that this leader is typically a military leader, but also a man of God, flawed, very flawed, <clears throat> typically. And he, it's, it's 11 times a he and one time a she. And by the way, the she, there is no bad parts about Deborah <clears throat> mentioned. No, none of her flaws are mentioned, only her strengths. She was an amazing judge of Israel. But in general, the other judges led battles against their enemies, destroyed or defeated their enemies, and then saved the Israelites from oppression. <clears throat> and once that happened, there was peace and there was prosperity for many years. Sometimes a few years, sometimes 20 years, sometimes 40 years, sometimes it's not mentioned. But then what happens? Then we have this little return back to beginning <laughs> arrow where after a while people forget about God and they go back to their old ways and they stop teaching their children about the Holy Scriptures and they stop teaching their children to love and respect God and they fall into following the other gods of this region, um, the pagan false gods, and the cycle happens again. Well, last week we were talking about uh, right in the middle of the story of Jephthah, one of the 12 judges of Israel. And we talked about Jephthah and his terrible vow. How many people remember his terrible vow? Lorna, what was his terrible vow? He said if he would come and uh, conquer these other nations, he would, um, he would uh, so sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house, mm -hmm. which ended up to be his daughter. And I'm just gonna say, what did he expect to come out of this house, right? right? You know, at the period, people didn't have pets. It wasn't really, you know, people didn't have two cats, three dogs, and a fish, right? <laughs> animals were animals used for utility and function. And although dogs would sometimes, you know, obviously dogs domesticated forms of wolves um, <clears throat> were, were uh, bred by human beings, they typically had a function, and that was, that was a livestock function. That was, that was, they were farm animals. Um, people didn't keep a lot of pets. Where am I going with this? Who else was going to come walking out of his house, mm -hmm. right? Um, it was going to be someone that he loved, and, and it ended up being his daughter. And the point was that God had already said, I will be with you. If you trust me and you believe in me, you follow my commandments, and, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, you pray, you trust, I'll take care of you. You don't have to make any rash vows. And this kind of gets at, <clears throat> he did make a rash vow, which went against what was commanded by Moses uh, in, uh, in the law, the, the five books of the law, he said, don't make rash vows to God because that's a sin. You don't have to do that. You don't have to bargain with God. Oh God, if I can just win the lottery, <laughs> I'll give you 50%, right? And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll start praying every day and I'll start reading the Bible. And God says, that's a sin. That's a sin. You don't have to do that. Well, Jephthah did it. He didn't have to. His daughter walks out of his house and he ends up sacrificing her. <clears throat> But that's not the end of the story, and we're going to finish the story today in Judges 12. And I think we're going to jump right into the Word. And I would like a volunteer, please. It's not a super long passage. We're going to read uh, Judges 12, 1 through 15. Who would like to read that for me today? <clears throat> then the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they crossed to Zephon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over the, to fight against the sons of Ammon without calling us to go with you? We will burn your house down on you. Jephthah said to them, I and my people were at great strife with the sons of Ammon. When I called with the <clears throat> when I called you, you did not deliver me from 
their hand. When I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my hands and crossed over against the sons of Ammon, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought Ephraim, <clears throat> and the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim, because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, O Gileadites, Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and in the midst of Manasseh. The Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan opposite Ephraim, and it happened with and it happened when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me cross over. Then the men of Gilead would say to him, Are you an Ephraimite? If he said no, then they would say to him, Say now, Shibboleth. But he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it correctly. Neither can I. <laughs> then they seized him and slew him at the fords of the Jordan. Thus there fell at the time 42,000 of Ephraim. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Now Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel after him. He had 30 sons and 30 daughters whom he gave in marriage outside the family. And he bought in, brought in 30 daughters from outside for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. Then Ibzan died and was buried in Bethlehem. Now Elon, the Zebulonite, judged Israel after him, and he judged Israel ten years. Then Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried at Aijalon in the land of Zebulon. Now Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Perathonite judged Israel after him. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on seven donkeys, and he judged Israel eight years. Then Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Perathonite, died and was buried at Pirathon in the land of Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. Excellent job, sir. You're a philologist, sure. linguist, archaeologist. Sure, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so, I think it's, it's just worth mentioning here, here's our map of the region. This is the important takeaway. Israel is 12 tribes at this point. 12 tribes who are what? What do you take away from this? Are they all getting along? Are they all happy singing, holding hands? What's going on They're right divided. now? They're divided. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. I'm going to ask the military guy. <coughs> of Israel divided. What's another name for this? What's actually happening here? Civil war. There is civil war, my friend. Civil war. <coughs> yes. There's no... Sorry. They're not a, a, a country. They're just each their own individual country. Among... God's people. <coughs> what does that remind you of? <laughs> Everybody. Everybody ever. <laughs> so it's, there's, a, there's a sense of, like, they know they're supposed to be getting along and together and doing things together. But uh, at least someone mentions it, right? Like, yeah. hey, why did you go do this without us? Should be. Mm. They should be. Yeah, united. Thank you. <coughs> I mean, don't, don't we have that sense too? Like, shouldn't we be getting along here? <laughs> Democrats, Republicans, shouldn't yeah, we be getting absolutely. along? Absolutely. Are Democrats not God's people? Yeah, Are Republicans not God's people? Mm -hmm. Are Muslims not the children of God? Are Hindus not the children of God? I'm not trying to force a United Nations thing down your throat here. I'm saying. God expects all of us to get together. And in this case, these are the chosen people of God. These are the people who God has revealed himself to. Say, I will protect you and nourish you, and you will be my people. I made a covenant with you. Twelve tribes, the twelve descendants of Jacob or Israel. You're supposed to be getting along, folks. We have open civil war here. 
I think the message here is I can show you the region. So here is, again, the tribes are underlined. Uh, maybe I'll do it this way. <coughs> maybe I'll just do it this way. Double underline means this is the area where the tribe was. Here's Manasseh, Ephraim, Dan, Benjamin, and Judah. Okay? And, and the lines are like this. They're not, they're not straight. <coughs> So really we're talking about this region here, but this is the, what river is this right here? Jordan. This is the Jordan River. It drains what we call Lake Gal Galilee, Sea of Galilee, Lake Chinnereth, drains down to the Dead Sea. <coughs> we call this Transjordan. That's a technical term, but it means the other side of the Jordan. Cisjordan is the same, same side, Transjordan. Transjordan has a lot of problems. It tends to have a lot of enemies of God, Moab, Ammonites, Amalekites, many ites. Here we have the tribe of Ephraim. Here we have the Gileadites. <laughs> I can't believe I actually said that. It rolled off the tongue so easily. <laughs> what are they doing? They're, they're actually, they're at the point where they distrust their brothers, their, their Israelite brothers so much, what do, they, what do they have this trick to kind of tell who's who? If they can't pronounce it right, they're not from there. I want you to pronounce this word, Shibboleth. And I'm going to listen how you pronounce it. Say Shibboleth. Sibboleth. What? Sibboleth. Oh, okay. Great. Come this way, right? <laughs> how many people are murdered? Murdered. Say it again. 42,000. 42,000 children of God, chosen people. This is open civil war, folks. How happy do you think God is that this is happening? Not. Not. Mm -hmm. What else do you take away from this passage? It's funny because it, it keeps happening over and over again when, when God raises up a judge and he goes and fights. At the end of the fight, someone from some other tribe comes along and says, why didn't you have us help you out? Which is very odd. Like, Why are they so mm -hmm. concerned about the fact that you need to help? Okay, let's talk about that for just a minute. Let's back up a chapter or two. What happened when, or, or and this has happened multiple times, a judge is raised up by God to deliver the people of Israel from their enemies. Typically, that judge will initially do what? Before he goes and fights. Yo, Ephraim, how's it going, bro? Right? Well, guess what? We're hiding in caves. <laughs> The Midianites, they got us in caves. They're taking all of our land, they're burning our crops, and they're taking our women and children. Yo, you want to come help us fight them? Hello? <laughs> Hello? What? This is exactly what happens. The judge will try and solicit help from the other tribes of Israel. Sometimes those tribes will help. Sometimes they'll hang up on him. Well, they'll hang up on him. They'll tell him no. They'll tell him, I'm not going to do it. Why? In heaven's name, would the tribes of Israel not help? And there's a pretty good reason for this. Or reasons. Good. I feel like the, I don't know, the downside is so bad. Like, if they <coughs> yeah. lose, like they're already under oppression, but if they lose, they feel like it will be even worse for them. You're, this is absolutely it. What's happening here is, and remember, this is a period of history, and we'll talk about this in the next week or two, in which all of the major powerful civilizations of the Mediterranean have collapsed or are in the process of collapsing. Um, Egypt, um, uh, 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 the Minoans are gone, um, uh, the Greeks, the Assyrians, they're all in the process of collapsing. And the reason that that's happening is, uh, it, it, what it's leading to is basically every man for himself. And we're living in a period again, remember I talked to you in, in Genesis, that we had um, this period of thug kings, the reign of thug kings, city-states. Okay, so that was way back in, in 2000 BC, uh, even earlier than that, when there weren't really these huge empires that ruled vast areas, it was kind of every city and state for himself. We have gone back to that, folks. We've gone back to this period where I'm just gonna protect my clan and you all can buzz off, right? <clears throat> And what happens though if I do? Well, let's say Judah and Benjamin and Dan and Ephraim all kind of, you know, go together. What happens if we lose? 
What happens if I lose? You lose everything. It is, it is all stakes. It is high stakes poker where the people probably feared for their lives. And what does that tell you? Now, the first thing is that is a reasonable human assumption is to say, if I go and I put my eggs into the basket of the latest judge of Israel and we fight the Midianites and we lose, we lose everything. They will kill all of our men. They will take our women and children. They will burn our land and we will be driven from it. We'd so rather sacrifice this little group over here. Just, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we can do without them. This is exactly it. This is every man, and I'll just, you know, every man for himself. But isn't that supposed to be their judge? Yes. Their judge? Yes. <laughs> Two? And what is this getting at, Angela? What is this getting at that the people of Israel are lacking? Unity. Yeah. They're lacking unity. Trust. They're lacking trust. They're lacking unity. <clears throat> They lack faith. Trust and faith in who? Or in whom? In God. The God that delivered them from, from Egypt. Goodness gracious me. My ancestors are here because God delivered us and promised us. You, I will give you a land flowing with milk and honey. But like, you don't even have to go that far back. Huh? Like yep. they also forget like <laughs> the last ten uh, guys. Gideon, yep. he defeated all these people, and then Deborah and Barak, you know, yeah. all these people, like they don't have to look that far. They just mm -hmm. you know, they don't let these things build up their faith at all. Let's do this. They're ignoring the past. And here is where I really get at. <clears throat> ignoring the past. Um, <clears throat> how do I say this? Ignoring the past when God intervened. I'm going to ask you, <clears throat> how many of you keep a prayer journal? Excellent. Oh, gold stars. I don't have like gift card for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll put your name in the credits, Chevelle. <laughs> Look, I just said it. Um, <clears throat> here's, here's my question for you. When God acts in your life, you, when, when you pray, consider yourself to, to be living back then. You cry out to God. <clears throat> you say, I repent. I have been faithless. I have sinned against you. Please intervene in my life, God. What happens when God intervenes? What, what do we do? What should we do? Worship. We should worship. <laughs> Thank him. Thank him. Tell everybody. Tell everybody, but you guys, everyone gets a gold star today. <laughs> <laughs> what, do we, what do we usually do? Get in the way. Get in the way. Take credit. Take credit. Move on. Move on. I got just, new problems. Even if it's just, man, look how good I was that I prayed for this. Yes. When was, when was this written? Uh -huh. So is this not, not getting written down at the time or shortly yep. after the time, right? This is much later. Hmm? You tell me. So <laughs> it's a good question. The question is, when was this written down? It was obviously written down after the event. Exactly sure when it was written and by whom. Um, some people think that Samuel wrote this. Um, so again, we can go back to our timeline. Here's 2000 BC, 1000 BC, 1 BC. Here's the time of, of Saul and David, which is around 1000. It's thought that the period here where we're about to talk about Samson is getting real close to the period of the monarchy. So we're getting real close to the end of the judges, which is probably around 1100 BC, give or take. <coughs> the references to some of the towns and the fact that this place is still called that or, or these people are still doing this or that has led scholars to believe it was written down sometime mm -hmm. maybe in the early monarchy. So sometime around the period of Samuel, which is right before this, around 1000 BC. But obviously so. they're <coughs> telling the stories yes. for someone to write it down hmm? later. You know, when you just hmm? say like, they're not, someone is giving God the credit at some point mm -hmm. yes. or writing it down so they remember yes. what God did for them, yes. but it's not sinking in or not getting to everybody or. Right. So I what? if mm -hmm. there's a little bit of, how many times have we made a joke, oh yeah, grandpa walked to school uphill both mm -hmm. ways in 10 feet of snow and. Sure, all those stories from the past. I mean, it, we, we succumb to those things yep. no differently than what they do. I mean, it, it's so easy to take 
shots, I think, at the Israelites yep. and to criticize them. None of us here have lived in mm -hmm. antiquity at this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and none of us have experienced raiding marauders yep. and all the different things <coughs> that are going on. And they don't have, mm -hmm. I mean, they've got the oral and they've got the stories, but you know, in, in the case of some of them, it's yep. been generations yes. since anyone's seen any miracles. Mm -hmm. So then they start to <coughs> doubt and I, I don't know if it's rightly so, but but it's understandably in some cases as to, do we really believe this? Mm -hmm. You know, do we believe great 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 grandpa really mm -hmm. went through all these things, yep. or or not? I I'm going to say that I in general agree with with what you're saying, and of course you know what I agree with is what's most important. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I will say this, Steve. I'll say this. In general, you're absolutely right about the fact mm -hmm. that what we tend to do is when something happens, it suddenly becomes the past, right? The present is always an infinitesimal line in, in space, and as soon as something happens, it's the past. And the further in the past it goes, the more we tend to forget, right? Humans have this strange, and maybe it's for a good reason, mm -hmm. strange perception of time. The further in the past something goes, the more we see it either with a rosy uh, goggles or we, we chalk it up to, to attribute it to things that maybe are not true. The further and further you go in the past, it's more of like this idea of, well, what has God done for me lately? Right? What have you done for me lately? Um, this, I think to Angela's point, is a prayer journal. <laughs> it, is, it is God's ultimate prayer journal for you. Human beings, through the word of God, have written down evidence that God is acting in our lives. Now, I will say this about your comment, Steve, about, about miracles. I believe that miracles happen every single day on this planet. Whether they get written down in the good book or not is a whole different thing. Um, I personally have seen miracles happen to people at Pathway because we have prayed. And, and I'll just call out, we have had people cured of cancer. We have had people find new relationships. We have had people find new careers that help them to, to spread the word of Christ. We have had people survive events overseas that they shouldn't have survived. I do believe that miracles happen each and every day, and this is why I kind of say I think it's important for us to have prayer journals, to write down when I see God acting in the world. It may not be Jesus walking on the water, but it may be I prayed that this person would be healed and they're healed now. It's really important for us to write that down and remember it. I think what's happening here is exactly what you were kind of saying at the beginning, which is now that these things have happened, we're kind of forgetting about them, especially because it was our ancestors. And I'm not trying yep. to say that's an excuse yep. and, and, and sure, something totally valid. Yeah. I, I'm just coming from the standpoint that it's easy to be a judge mm -hmm. from our standpoint and to be critical mm -hmm. when we, in turn, do many of the same things today. Yep. We like to like think of ourselves as better. Like, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yep. But like, you know, I can think of a time just this morning when I was like, you know, worried about something and I'm like, no, like why am I doing this? Like God, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 So. Totally agree 100%. That's right. We need to write that down and say how worried you were. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So that later we can judge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good. Very good. Are they following um, traditions? Is the Torah written down at this point? Yep, the so is, right? the law is the written. Laws. They should have the law at this point. Um, and of course, uh, many of the references uh, come from that. It's kind of interesting because it, it's a whole tangent. Yes, they have the law at this point. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stop, my, stop myself. <laughs> I'm going to a 20-minute discussion there. I'd say there's enough details here. You know, how long each judge was the judge, the 42,000 died. It, you know, there's enough numbers and details that obviously somebody was write, writing it down, but the circulation was, you know, where they, you know, passing mm -hmm. stone tablets from house to house. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't, they didn't have the internet where we could just go out on Facebook every morning mm -hmm. and see what's going on. So the, that, that's a great point. So we can talk real quickly about this. Let me talk about it over here. Let me talk about the transmission of scripture. <clears throat> real quick, two minutes, maybe. Two minutes. Scripture, two minutes. Start. Go. There is writing during this period. 
Writing is, we found it. We can dig it up out of the ground. It is called Paleo-Hebrew, that is at least. During this period, Hebrew is being written down and it's being, and, and maybe a thing to say about this is there is a lot of writing. It's maybe not as much writing as during the monarchy, <clears throat> during this period, but we do find writing. We find a lot of writing from the um, neighboring states of Egypt in particular, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So we know that there's writing, uh, which suggests what? When cultures have a lot of writing going on, what does that tell you? Educated. Say it again? Educated. They're educated. In order to be educated, what does that tell you about society? There's some sort of prosperity. There's prosperity, there's stability, there's money because people who are on the run for their lives don't sit down and, <coughs> and learn about advanced physics, right? They're like, I, it's, it's, I'm gonna survive or I'm gonna die. However, during this period, <coughs> there's not as much. There's gaps. We certainly don't get, and, and don't get me wrong, look, um, from all of antiquity, the further back you go, we get far fewer samples of anything from antiquity. There, there aren't copious amounts of libraries that we've, we've uncovered from this period. There's lots of fragments, but they're very fragmentary. So it seems like even though there was writing, it's not very widespread. There's gaps in our record. So it suggests um, that, and I will say from the, from the scripture we do have, what does this suggest to you that's going on in Israel during this period? Are things stable? For some. Yeah, but for many, this is, this is a period of turmoil. <clears throat> so I think what you can conclude from this is, and, and let me say one more thing about this. Writing is not the primary means for transmitting information in antiquity. What was the primary means of transmitting information? Story. Oral. Oral, oral. oral stories, word of mouth. People would sit down, and remember, writing, people who are literate, this is, even in antiquity, during the best times of antiquity, this is two or three percent of the population. Vast majority of people, especially during this period, had no idea how to read or write. Mm -hmm. So, they're transmitting it by telling stories. Fathers and mothers would sit down with their children at night and tell them the stories of their exodus out of Egypt. Yep. Like yep. so yes, Some songs poetry. So I think the point is, while there was some writing, they knew the scriptures. We, we believe they were definitely written down by this point, at least in some form, and there was word of mouth. So they, there's really no excuse. They should have had access to knowing who God was. But at the end of the day, who is the weak link in providing that access to the next generation? We are. We are one generation away from extinction meaning Christianity. Why? Because if every Christian mother and father today doesn't bother to tell their children about the Bible, or about God's faithfulness, or about how God has worked in their lives, guess how many of our children are going to be Christians? Well, it'll probably be some. It probably won't be zero. Churches go down to yeah. zero, and there's no young people bringing it up. Yeah. And it's just older people. Yeah. <clears throat> there's a church in Missouri that way. A minister came to mm -hmm. Iowa. Uh, because it was just old, old people, older people, no kids, no nobody yep. keep it going. A lot of the stuff that we're reading about here is very obvious. I mean, war and death and yeah. killing and hiding and all that stuff is very obvious. A lot of the stuff that we don't talk about today with our kids is yep. embarrassing mm. and small. Mm -hmm. You know, I, <clears throat> I have two adult kids that are following God. Yep. And, Amazing, you know, what they're doing with their life. And I, I attribute it to that I was just, here I am. Mm -hmm. This is this is my pile of garbage, this is my good, this is, you know, mm -hmm. what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. and they were always given the opportunity to recognize <coughs> how much I needed God for right. a while, okay. you know, and that and the allowed to make their own decision on how much they needed too. Mm -hmm. It, because I, I see, especially in the church, there's we put on this show 
for our kids especially. Yep. Look how good we are. Look how, you know, just don't let them see the, the bad. If we don't let them see the bad, how, why do we need God? <coughs> yep. Right. I think, too, what you were saying, though, in terms of, like, God's faithfulness. So it's God's faithfulness even if what you've prayed for is not what you get. Yep. Right. And so how ultimately mm -hmm. all of this is really, really painful that they're going through, mm -hmm. but God's plan it will still be yes. like done and completed and it's better. Um, so even, like, teaching our kids, like, yep. you might have prayed for this, but something else might be in the works, and you have to be patient and wait for that, too. I love that, Cheval. That's great. That's I exactly prayed for a mini bike when I was a little kid for years. Uh -huh. Never got it. <laughs> Same why. <laughs> Says the guy with the broken left right. arm. Right. Five places. Uh, Several reasons why, okay? <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on, because we actually have an amazing chapter now, one of the best in the whole What's the, book. Uh, what do you think? So it mentions three more judges here. Yes, right? okay. All it tells about how many kids they had, how long they judged, and when, where they were buried. Mm -hmm. they didn't do anything else? I mean, you know, it's like we get into a lot of detail yep. about some of them, and then there's yeah. boom, boom, boom. Yep. Here's three that came to mm -hmm. We don't really care much mm -hmm. about detail on it. Yeah. That, the last okay. judge had kids and lots of donkeys, so yeah. this, I mean, it made it sound like at least he had a lot of wealth. Uh -huh. like he didn't have enough. Oh, 70 donkeys. Yeah. I thought it said 70. Yeah. It's not a thing, yeah. too. Too great. I think this is another good point about Holy Scripture, which is it's not complete. It's an incomplete record. And kind of getting back to what Angela was getting at, who wrote Judges? Who wrote Judges? We don't know the name of the person, but who well, who is God, authoring it? God. Okay. God is inspiring it. Right. Mm -hmm. But what is the human element here? At the end of this, and we've talked about this, we are, we are, we are barreling towards the monarchy. The monarchy meaning the first true kings of Israel. What, and again, I come back to this, who wrote it? Who did they write it to and why? The author of Judges is trying to make a case here. And what is that case, that big case he's trying to make? Pro-monarchy. Pro-king. Mm -hmm. He's definitely not like uh, sugarcoating any of their past. Yes. Like he's making it showy exactly what it was. Yeah. And, the author. You know, yep. He doesn't try to make like, Gideon look better or... The disorganization yeah. and mm -hmm. the inner fighting and the need for... Yeah. Like how bad do you think Israel need needs one big... A king guy to take over, and this is not the last time that they killed each other either. They nope. almost wiped out the entire tribe of Benjamin. Later, I think it's later on, mm -hmm. like, like twenty or something. Like I think, you know, when you read these, and and another thing to keep in mind is that the authors, the 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 Israelite and Jewish authors who wrote the Holy Scriptures, were very concerned about genealogies, and about historical records. <coughs> They wanted to keep records of what has happened in their country for future generations to teach to them. Sometimes the records that they have were fragmentary. All they knew was what was written down here. Sometimes it kind of gives you the sense that it kind of adds to the chaos, and this is my subjective interpretation of this, is that we throw in, oh, and then another judge came along, but he only reigned for a few years. He was moderately successful, and then he died. <coughs> I think, again, this gets at why the author is writing this. He's saying, without a monarchy, without a clear succession plan, without a unified king to rule all of us and a stable government, you get this. Mm -hmm. You get Tom, Dick, and Harry popping up, obviously ordained by God, don't get me wrong, but that it's still chaotic and, it's, and you don't know what to expect. Because what happens? What happens when <clears throat> Abdon, son of Hillel, dies? Well, then again, the Israelites do evil in the sight of the Lord, right? I think the author is making a case here. Things are chaos, and without stability, they continue to be chaotic. And what is the ultimate result of that chaos? 13 verse 1 says it. What's the biggest impact to that? I'm not reading it, but I'm guessing disobedience to God. Without? They get ruled by someone else. Without a king, without a king, people fall away from God. Well, yes, I think 
for for those who don't see God as king, mm -hmm. they're going to fall away anyway, because he's not presenting the argument. He's like he he's not looking at. He thinks that once they become a, have a king, that everything's going to be rosy. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, it's not. Mm -hmm. This is, and again, let's let's be clear that we're separating here the author of Judges. Yeah. His two t two cents here is we need a king. We need a king because without it, there's all this chaos. There's religious chaos. There is military chaos. There is civil war chaos. He could be writing to support the existence of an already king. That's my. That's what I'm yeah. getting at here, yeah. which is, folks, and it's what Roger was saying. And if which he is, didn't, yep. well, then he's in trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because the king's going to get word that, hey, your scribe is off writing that there shouldn't be a king. and You already. God says you already have a king. Yeah. <laughs> Who is that? Yeah, yeah where <laughs> is he? <laughs> and that's where the people we do? are saying, where is he? Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's exactly it. <laughs> All right. Let's go. This is great. Let's go ahead and jump into chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 to 25. Who would like to read that for me? <laughs> Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Philistines who oppressed them for 40 years. In those days, a man named Noah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. The woman ran and told her husband, A man of God appeared to me. He looked like one of God's angels, terrifying to see. I didn't ask where he was from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he told me, You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink or eat any forbidden food. For your son will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from the moment of his birth until the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord, saying, Lord, please let the man of God come back to us again and give us more instructions about this son who is to be born. God answered Manoah's prayer, and the angel of God appeared once again to his wife, and as she was sitting in the field. But her husband Manoah was not with her, so she quickly ran and told her husband, The man who appeared to me the other day is here again. Manoah ran back with his wife and asked, Are you the man who spoke to my wife the other day? Yes, he replied, I am. So Manoah asked him, when your words come true, what kind of rules should govern the boy's life and work? The angel of the Lord replied, be sure your wife follows the instructions I gave her. She must not, drink, she must not eat grapes or raisins, drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, or eat any forbidden food. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please stay here until we can prepare a young goat for you to eat. I will stay, the angel of the Lord replied, but I will not eat anything. However, you may prepare a burnt offering as a sacrifice to the Lord. Manoah didn't realize it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah asked the angel of the Lord, what is your name? For when all this comes true, we want to honor you. Why do you ask my name? The angel of the Lord replied, it is too wonderful for you to understand. Then Manoah took a young goat and a grain offering and offered it on a rock as a sacrifice to the Lord. And as Manoah and his wife watched, the Lord did an amazing thing. As the flames from the altar shot up toward the sky, the angel of the Lord ascended in the fire. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell with their faces to the ground. The angel did not appear again to Manoah and his wife. Manoah finally realized it was the angel of the Lord, and that he said to his wife, we will certainly die, for we have seen God. But his wife said, if the Lord were going to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted our burnt offering and grain offering. He wouldn't have appeared to us and told us this wonderful thing and done these miracles. When her son was born, she named him Samson, and the Lord blessed him as he grew up. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him while he lived in Mahanathan, which is located <coughs> between the towns of Zorah and Eshtol. Thank you. This is a remarkable chapter. First of all, I'm going to ask you this. For those of you who have been reading the, the previous chapters, how does this differ from the other judges, the origins of the other judges? He's, a, he's chosen from before his birth even. So 
All the rest of them were adults who were chosen. Chosen from birth. From before birth. Right. And there's specific things that have to happen for him to yes. be the judge. Yes, there's rules. What are those rules? Not cut his hair and not drink. He's going to be a Nazarite. Nazarite vow. We'll talk about that in just a moment. What else is weird about this passage? Weird. One time I listened to a hmm? Father's Day sermon on this passage, hmm? and I just thought it was really cool that his parents um, both followed the Lord, hmm? and uh, hmm? that they sought the Lord's help in how to raise him. They wanted to yes. know the right way to raise him, which I thought was cool. They sought so guidance. Wow, we, how many judges have we talked about up till now who really, as one of their flaws, has been kind of ignoring God, not going to God to ask what they should do, right? Maybe Abimelech, if you want to call him a judge, is the biggest egregious person of that. He didn't seek God's counsel at all. Big picture, how does Samson's parents find out that this is going to happen? Through God. Through God, but exactly how? Angel of the Lord. What does this remind you of? This is a perfect season for this. This is, the, folks. This is so similar to the to the to the Annunciation, the story of the announcing Gabriel announcing the birth of Christ to Mary. Um, who does the angel talk to first? The woman. The woman. Who does the angel talk to second? The woman. The woman. <laughs> Eventually, who? The husband. The husband. Yeah. This is very similar to the parallel of the angel announcing uh, the coming of Christ to Mary, and then the angel announcing it to Joseph in a dream. This is yeah. similar in the other judges in that when you tr like when Gideon truly sought yeah. God, like he was like, God, can you please help me in my faith? Mm -hmm. You know, like can you just do this other thing for me? Like when they when Noah prayed and said, Hey, can you please let this man of mm -hmm. God come and talk to us yeah. again? That God is very gracious and willing to like if you seek him with a like a mm -hmm. you know yes, like yes. pure heart that he is very willing to help Seeking you. God's counsel with a humble heart. It's not dictating terms, folks. It's, please help me. I'm willing to learn. Um, what's the angel's name? He Wonderful. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm not going to. Why do you want to know my name? It's wonderful. Where have we heard that before? Uh, Jacob. I love you, sweetheart. Gold star for you. Jacob wrestles with the angel. The angel says, what is your name? My name is Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you struggled with God. Mm -hmm. Jacob says, well, what's your name? And he's like, why do you want to know my name? Mm -hmm. What does this tell you about angels? They're just a messenger. They're not to be... Oh, that's a good one. They're just the messenger. They're, they are really <coughs> God's word. What else about them? Have the tendency to want to worship the angel. Though. Yes, yeah. this is so good. But the angels never allow it. They're like, this no. is so good. This is exactly because they know. Yeah. What did what what did Gideon do with the ephod? For heaven's sakes, he had a breastplate that they worshipped. And if I know this angel's name, guess who's the next one I'm going to worship? Yeah. yeah. This is a great one. Hmm. Um, let's talk about Samson. His name will be Samson. Real quick, I told you that. Well, let's talk about the worshiping thing. There were a lot of gods worshipped here, pagan gods that were worshipped in this region. Some of them were common ones, Baal, Shamash, Molech. Zora, which is right here, kind of right in the Judean foothills, right before you get to the plains where um, the Philistines lived, is Zora. Real close by is this town called Eshtaal. In Eshtaal, there was a huge cult of people worshipping the sun. Okay. Now, we all know that the worship of the sun is a very common thing in antiquity, right? A lot of cultures have gods associated with the sun. Does anyone know what Samson's name means? Little sun. What? Little sun. Little sun. What? Yeah. 
It's good. It's good. That's good. There'll be there'll be circus music during that part. What what does this imply to you? What does this imply to you? There's some some things you might think here. Okay. That's one. That's a positive. What's the negative? So I don't think it's too much of a stretch, and, and, and scholars will tell you this, that <clears throat> there seems to be still pagan worship going on, and Samson's family is caught up in it. But what does this tell you about what they're saying to the angel here? This is, this is the constant conflict, folks, between the gods of your life and the god of the universe. What are Samson's parents likely struggling with here? I mean, that's it. Worshiping the one true God. Now, we, of course, we don't know for sure if that's exactly what's going on here. I just thought you would like to know that. Okay, tell me more about, about this passage. What else do you take away from this? Oh, and while you're thinking of that, let's talk about what the Nazarite vow is. Does anyone know what the... There's three rules for the Nazarite vow. We've talked about two of them here. Well, have we talked about two? At least one of them. In this case, what are the, the three, if you know it? Well, they set apart themselves for total worship to yes. God, so they can't drink any alcohol. Can't drink alcohol. Not only that, they can't drink anything from the wine. Yeah, so nothing. nothing. Grapes. No grapes. Yeah. Yep. No grapes. Yeah. No grapes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Does what else? Go away too. He doesn't really get raised by his parents. Um, that's that's not part of the Nazarite. A vow. I think it gets at what the global thing, what Steve is saying, which is you kind of set yourself apart from society. And in doing so, what's the other famous thing that Samson couldn't do? Hair. Don't cut your hair. Weren't you also not allowed to be anywhere near a dead body? That's it. No, Cannot be near a dead body. So even if your like, parents died, you couldn't, be couldn't, near couldn't bury him, couldn't touch him, couldn't go near him. That's right. Who is a famous person of the New Testament that takes a Nazarite vow? Yes. Paul the Apostle does it right before he's arrested in Jerusalem. Uh, eventually, yes. Yes, but I think the point was that he had been growing it, and then at the end of the vow, he cut his hair. He, he ceremonially washed and cut his hair, yeah. So, okay, good. What, okay, and I'm just going to, you know, forecasting, because I think some of us know where all this is going. There are three rules to the Nazarite vow. How many of these does Samson break? All three. More than once. And, well, he breaks two of them in yeah. one instant. <laughs> he's like, just cut, he's walking through three. a vineyard, which he wasn't yeah. supposed to walk through one, huh? and he gets honey out of a dead lion. Yep. So that's not <laughs> <everything>. <laughs> that's exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. Now, Samson, huh? he's kind of a, a microcosm yeah. of Israel. Yes. Because every time he turns to the Lord, great things happen. Yes. His ways aren't all these wonderful things, and then every time he gives in to sinful temptation, things go sideways for This him. is exactly it. But here's, here's a question for you. He continues to break the Nazarite vow through his life. And here's, here's some other little things about Samson that he's a little different. He is not a military leader. At no time does he raise up an army and lead it. He, how does he act? Unilateral guerrilla warfare. It's me against the world, right? Dude picks up the gates from the city and carries them away. We'll get to that. Uh, but he's on his own. Um, but, but what do we, we know, and we're going to get into this, time and again, he, he, he fails. He, he is flawed. And yet, what does God do with him? Amazing things miraculous, wonderful things. What does this tell you about he God's plan? A lot of second chances. Second, third, fourth, yes. Thankfully. Yes. We do too. <clears throat> Many second chances. I want to kind of wrap up with this. It was God's plan that Samson would fulfill God's plan. Samson was going to be a tool for that. Even though Samson failed, was God's plan still fulfilled? Can you 
fulfill the plan of God and still be a flawed human. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. And you can still be a flawed human being, Lorna, and still fulfill the will of God and still be used by God for his purpose, his glorious purpose. So we don't have to worry. I'm, I'm a teacher, an elder. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm trying to be a good person. But in the end of the day, God's will is going to happen no matter what. I want to be a part of that. I want to be on that train. But if I mess up and I'm repentant about it, God's, I, you know, God says it's still going to happen. Let's real quickly, I want to talk about the Amarna letters. I think it's important to have a little bit of this in every class. This is the apologetics of the Old Testament and New Testament. Last week we talked about the Merneptah Stele, which is a monument built by a pharaoh around 1200 BC, which he mentions the name of Israel directly. He says, Israel is laid waste, his seed is not, meaning I went and conquered those Israelites, um, <clears throat> which is not recorded in the Bible and doesn't seem like it was a great victory because they're still there. But even before that, way back, right when the Israelites had conquered Canaan, these letters of clay, basically they're beautiful, these little pillows of clay were written as letters and transmitted from kingdom to kingdom. These letters were unearthed in the Middle East that were written by Egyptians, talking about the Hapiru, or Habiru. Um, what does it say? It's a great window into life during the mid-14th century BC, talking about Canaan. There's a whole bunch of them talking about this region, which was basically a district of Egypt at the time. It says this, the letters from Canaan provide a rare glimpse into conditions a half century or so after the conquest. This was early in the period of the judges, when individual tribes were consolidating their hold upon the land. The biblical account is similar to the situation reflected in the Amarna letters. So here we have corroborating evidence. What we're reading here is not just fantasy. We have a third party independent account who has no interest in following God, confirming what is written here. <clears throat> The city-state rulers reported hostilities throughout Canaan. Boy, that's surprising. In particular, they complained about a group of people called the Hapiru. If the Pharaoh did not take actions, the letter warned, all of Canaan would be taken over by these people. Hmm. The king of Jerusalem lamented, and remember at this time, Jabus is not ruled <coughs> by the Hebrews. That king says, the war against me is severe. Hapiru have plundered all of the lands of the king. Folks, we have third-party physical evidence that what is written about in the Holy Bible is actually taking place here. These tribes of people, and again, the Hipiru, maybe the Hebrews, they are certainly Canaanites, meaning a group of people that were probably more than just Israelites, but these Canaanites were causing problems. They were city-states, they were fighting against each other, and more importantly, they were fighting against the friends of Egypt. Okay. Thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you next week.